example of medical cannabis um, for cancer patients and how to access medical cannabis under the current Health Canada process with a reminder that that may change sometime in the future based on the government's working forward to look at legislation or regulation of um, recreational marijuana, which is a whole different uh, discussion that I won't get into today. So marijuana has been around for centuries. The, this uh, particular slide um, gives us a little piece from an ancient Chinese herbal pharmacopoeia that talks about the use of uh, marijuana. Marijuana in Chinese, I believe, is called ma fen, and it's used for waste diseases and injuries. It clears blood and it undoes rheumatism. If taken in excess, it produces hallucinations and a staggering gait. If taken over a long term, it causes one to communicate with spirits enlightens one's body. That's a very poetic way of saying that you can get high from marijuana, but it also it talks about some of the medical purposes, the waste diseases, the injuries, undoes blood and rheumatism. Very interesting that they found that even as far back as 2700 BC. If we take a look at cannabis in, in history, it's been very important from a number of points of view. This slide takes a, it shows a couple, of, uh, a, a couple or three things that are important. First of all, of course, it's been used as food. So hemp, hemp seeds is an important source of both protein and uh, fats, omega-3s, omega-6s, um, are very important fatty acids that we need in the body. The fiber, the actual stems, uh, can make a very, very strong fiber. In fact, many of the ships that sailed across the ocean in the early uh, 15, 16, 1700s had hemp rope that was responsible for keeping them afloat. The, um, the drug, the medicine, the flowers, has been around as a medicine for probably more than 200 years. And, and I'm saying that uh, as recognized by the... Um, by, by Western nations. It was initially found to be useful based on observations that were made in India during the 1830s to 1850s, and that moved over to England and throughout Europe in the 1800s into North America in the late 1800s, and it was still listed on the pharmacopoeia as late as the 1930s and 1940s in Canada when it was, thought to, when it was then thought to be a problem and was listed as a dangerous drug. For those of you who don't know it, this is a picture of cannabis sativa. This is an actual plant, and you can see that there are um, beautiful buds that are there. There's some leaves. Those buds are the things that are very important. And if we take a look at a close-up view, you can see that those leaves have, and that they, upon those leaves and stems, there are something called trichomes. And those trichomes, those little little things that are kind of budding out of the leaves and stems here. They, those are the uh, important parts of the plant that contain all the cannabinoids, and the cannabinoids are the medicine that we find within this cannabis plant. So just to help us to, in, to know what we're going to talk about, cannabis is the actual plant. There are two particular species that are in general use, the sativa versus the indica. Um, it's also known as hemp on the street. It's known as marijuana and many, many other names. A cannabinoid are the actual components of the plant, the organic components that are found that have some effect upon the body. So things like the tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, cannabidiol or CBD, cannabigerol or CBG, and there's a number of other uh, of those sort of compounds. Within our own body, there is something called the endocannabinoid system. In other words, there are actual receptors in our body for these cannabinoids, for these types of uh, medications. We've also found chemicals, uh, trans neural transmitters that, that will attach themselves to the receptors and have a difference or make a difference in terms of our sensation. So as we've been uh, seeing over the past 10 to 15 years, there's been an increase in interest in uh, marijuana, and sometimes you find that the uh, younger people are, are asking the older people for advice, especially because the older ones seem to have less of an attitude towards the use of marijuana as a medicine. I thought it was really important that we would review how this actually works, and it's also important to remember what's inside a marijuana plant. Why is it that we're looking at this plant and let's say 
something else that we're not looking at. So there are a number of different compounds within a marijuana plant, especially within the dried leaves, the flowering heads, that's where things are really concentrated. Of those compounds, of those chemicals, about 70 to 80 of the percent, sorry, 70 to 80 different types of cannabinoids are found within the plant. And of those, there are a number that are psychoactive, like the delta 9 THC. There are others that are not psychoactive, cannabidiol. And then there's a bunch of other inactive compounds. I, we don't know a whole lot about them, although there's more and more research coming out about those all the time. Now this is a, a complicated sort of slide for people to understand and I'm not going to go through it um, bit by bit but just what I want to point out is that these chemicals, these neural transmitters actually work at the level of the nerves. So the nerves are important for us to sense things such as pain, nausea, vomiting, um, you know, our anxiety, all those things are, are, are propagated through the nerve. And what cannabinoids do, um, they actually turn up or turn down the effect of the transmission of those sensations. So usually it can help to decrease that transmission, especially in things like pain, let's say. So this can happen from within, in other words, chemicals within our own body, or this can happen from without, that's when we take marijuana or uh, other sort of pharmaceutical cannabinoids, and we'll talk about that in just a second. When we look at research, research has been key to knowing all about the cannabinoids, and we've had more and more research over the past 20 years than we've had previously, mainly because there's been uh, more information coming to us, there's been, a more, uh, there's been an increased openness about researching marijuana, not as much as, a, as an illegal plant, but with a plant that has very, uh, very much medical capabilities. And you can see that when people were investigating the, the system inside of our own bodies, those endocannabinoids, there's evidence that that has an effect in a number of different systems. So things like immune function or appetite digestion, cardiovascular function, memory, pain. There's some issues around psycho, it, it has some effect on psychomotor behavior or in psychiatric disease, has some regulation of wake and sleep cycles, and it has some importance in terms of our learning abilities. And it's really important, especially when we're talking about it, the view in Canada, who actually is using medical cannabis? And back in 2000, there was a study that was uh, published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, had a telephone uh, interview of a, a, a population of uh, Canadians, and they found that about 2% of the population were using cannabis for medical purposes. Now, this was just at the start of the Health Canada medical marijuana program. And that first iteration of the uh, program about 37,000, somewhere between 37 and 38,000 people had registered with the, that program. It was called the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations, or the MMAR. And of those, they found that approximately 6% had a cancer diagnosis. So it was the cancer population was very small when we looked at, at the overall population using that. Health Canada rejigged the program in, um, in April of 2014, I believe. And we had about 50,000 people were registered with the MMPR, so that went until March of this year. And then it changed again and now has been relabeled. And it has um, opened up the ability of people to not only use from the licensed producers, but now we can actually assign people to grow for ourselves. So we might be able to assign someone who will be recognized by Health Canada and the um, local police as a grower of a note, get your marijuana that way. Unfortunately, we don't have any really good epidemiologic studies. In other words, we don't know how many people who have cancer are using this. Is this a, a big issue for patients? I know from my, own, uh, from my own clinic that there are a number of patients coming to see me. I probably get anywhere from two to three consults a week looking people looking to use medical cannabis and use it in, in, uh, in an appropriate way for their cancer support. And just another slide, just to show you how things have changed, even over um, a, a year or a little less, or a little over a year, 
Um, in the first quarter of 2014, or sorry, 2015, we had about 23,000 patients, 24,000 patients, and they were using about 3.3 grams of dried marijuana per day. If we take a look at the second quarter of this particular year, July 1st to September 30th, we see that people are using, the, the numbers are up to almost 100,000 people, and they're using an equivalent dose of medical marijuana. Are we in Canada alone in this? No, not at all. In fact, there's been some very nice studies telling us about what people, if people are using this for medicinal purposes. What are they using? How are they using it? This is a study that was published in 2013. Um, this looks at a number of different countries, both in Europe, Canada, and the United States. Dr. Mark Ware is our representative in Canada on this study. And it shows that people are using it for things like chronic pain, anxiety, appetite, depression, and sleeping problems. And you can see that the, the most people were using it in a smoked fashion, not necessarily what I would ta uh, support, but this is just looking at what is the, what's the environment out there right now. Interestingly, it doesn't matter which way you take it, whether you smoke it, you vaporize it, or you take it as a food or tea, the amount that you're using per day or amount that people are using per day is almost equivalent, 3 grams versus 2.4 grams. The frequency is different, and that really speaks to how long the effect lasts. So when you smoke it, the, it's fast, it, it starts working quickly, but it, it fades off very quickly as well, probably about two hours. So that would mean that people are using it, it says they're on average six times per day they're smoking to get some benefit. Whereas when you're taking it orally, it takes a little bit longer to work, maybe as much as an hour, but afterwards it lasts for as long as 12 hours. So people are only taking it twice a day. And so that gives us information uh, about how to prescribe. It also gives us some more information on what are we looking at, how do we bring people in and uh, put them on the marijuana, and also why are we looking at that? What, is, what sort of um, evidence is there for the use of marijuana in patients who have any sort of chronic disease? Today I'm going to focus in on cancer. So certainly there are indications, in other words, medications that are called pharmaceuticals, drugs that have been derived from the marijuana plant are available. They have been approved by Health Canada. They are, a number of them are approved under the uh, individual provincial programs. Some are not, but the on-label indications for those include things like nausea and vomiting, especially from chemotherapy, chronic pain, both from MS and cancer, and that when we talk about neuropathic pain, we talk more about nerve-related pain. And of course, there's some anorexia, and in this case, associated with AIDS or HIV. We've also seen this happen in cancer. But there's a lot of other evidence out there, both from anecdotal, in other words, what people are observing, as well as very small but emerging studies at a number of different areas. And you see that listed here, both in terms of MS, insomnia, PTSD, spasticity, epilepsy, we hear about that quite a bit. There's a little bit of study looking at fibromyalgia, so a whole bunch of other areas outside of cancer. This next slide talks about the different types of symptoms that we see in cancer patients. This, is, this actually comes from a study from uh, about 10 years ago, and you can see that the ranges can be quite wide. But the symptoms there, a number of them can be helped by the use of medical cannabis including pain, anxiety, nausea, and anorexia. And those are the ones that we'll be talking about today. So if we take a look at, at pain, pain probably has the strongest clinical evidence for use in patients who have neuropathic type pain. There, when I talk about preclinical, I'm really talking about evidence coming out of the lab, maybe using an animal model, in other words, a, a, either a rat or um, a mouse model that uh, helps us to understand how this works in pain. Um, but in clinical, there's actually more and more studies out there telling us about the use of medical cannabis. The uh, strongest evidence comes from the use in both bone pain and neuropathic pain, both in cancer and outside in, in a, a more benign um, conditions. Um, and there's also a number of different studies that are looking at things such as 
uh, changing how the enzymes which break down the cannabinoids in the body will work. And this is, this is just at a very early stage. We've also got some evidence that if we were to apply the uh, marijuana on the skin, that might work well. This is especially done in animals. We haven't seen a whole lot of that in humans yet. So as I've put up on this slide, the trial evidence tells us that if we use it orally in cancer pain, in cancer pain we actually can get some benefit. It's usually used in addition to other medications. There's been some small studies using uh, smoked vaporization. There hasn't been any using oils as yet, although oils are available in Canada. That's a relatively recent um, phenomenon. One of the things that we have noticed very interestingly is that we've had a decrease in the number of a number and the amount of pain medications that people use when they have pain, which is quite remarkable considering that this is a uh, plant and you're not using a whole ton of it, but you can make a big difference in the amount of pain, other pain medications that you use. And as I said, there are few adverse events. In other words, although people talk about what happens when you're using it recreationally, when people are using it for medicinal purposes, the uh, adverse events or the side effects are quite minimal. So there's been enough information out there for uh, researchers to actually group together those studies, look at them, analyze them, and come up with some very broad statements regarding the use of medical cannabis. This is one study that comes out of the East Coast. Dr. Lynch and Dr. Campbell uh, come from uh, Halifax and Toronto, respectively. And this next study comes from uh, Dr. Lynch again and Dr. Ware, who is a, a researcher out of Montreal. And what they've done is both of these studies have looked at those, those, num those smaller studies and put them together and said, what's the, what's the data telling us? And although the studies are small or they're short, they do have, they do have evidence that tells us that these cannabinoids, these med this medical marijuana is safe. It demonstrates a modest analgesic effect provides a reasonable treatment option for chronic non-cancer pain. And they said that because they don't have a huge number of studies that they can use in cancer patients. However, we certainly can extrapolate, we can look at what's been done outside of a cancer and we can say let's use it in cancer patients and let's see what the benefits are. This information is strong enough for the Canadian Pain Society to change their recommendations regarding the use of cannabinoids. They now say it's a solid third level uh, trial, or sorry, third level treatment. And you can see that there are other medications that are used prior to that, but it certainly is something that they're, uh, that they're supportive in terms of their use. So now we're gonna go on to nausea. And what is the evidence of the use of nausea in cancer patients, uh, or the use of marijuana for nausea in cancer patients? And again, we look at the preclinical, so what's happening in the lab. There is a, uh, a lab, um, a, a, um, a research lab in Guelph, where uh, the researcher, Dr. Linda Parker, has been using an animal model to help us understand nausea better. And they've shown some very good benefit using can cannabis um, different types of the cannabis extracts and they're being able to show that they can actually stop nausea in their tra its tracks. We know from a clinical point of view that there is actually lots of evidence for the use, lots of support for the use of cannabinoids in nausea. Most of it has been used in chemotherapy induced nausea. In fact, it was um, quite a popular drug prior to the introduction of what we call the ondansetrons, granisetrons, the cetrons. Um, there's still a role for this to play. We still use um, both nabilone and other types of extracts for patients who are receiving chemotherapy and having difficulty with nausea. This is just a list of some of those studies. You can see that a number of them um, use other drugs that, you know, were the um, cannabis was compared to other drugs um, and there was some good benefit. Again, there was enough evidence that people sat down and they reanalyzed all those uh, studies together and they said, how can we use this information to design better treatment for our patients who have nausea? And this group said in selected patients, cannabinoids may be useful as a mood enhancing adjuvant, in other words, a mood enhancing helper for the control of chemotherapy related 
sickness. In other words, not only does it help out with the nausea, but it can help elevate the mood of patients and they're going to actually feel better and probably better able to tolerate their chemotherapy in the long run. There have even been some small studies looking at the use of inhaled marijuana. In other words, true cannabis, medical cannabis out there. Um, one of them was actually done here in Winnipeg in the mid-80s. And it showed that there was, um, all, all of the studies showed evidence of benefit. People said that there were, though, there were some side effects, though, probably because the dose that they were using was very high compared to what we would use now. And interestingly, anywhere from a quarter to a third of the patients preferred marijuana over the other drugs that they were using at that time. If we look at appetite and weight loss, this is a particular problem in many of our cancer patients. Many of our patients have difficulty even looking at food, the smell of food, the taste of food really has uh, diminished because of the use of either the chemotherapy or the cancer itself. And we can see that in terms of preclinical, yes, there's more and more evidence of what we can use or how we can uh, use cannabis or cannabinoids. There's less clinical evidence um, and again, I think it's because we were, it, these are older studies and they were not using the same sort of products that we have available today. This slide uh, explains a paper that came out of the journal Nature back in 2015. And although the, the headline there, the hypothalamic POMC neurons, that, that is a little scientific. Really what it means is that marijuana flips that appetite switch in the brain. So even though people uh, giggle about um, you know, using a little marijuana and then having the munchies, those munchies are very important for increasing that appetite, that need for food for patients. And they've been able to, to document the change that happens in our brains, the hormones that change, and thus the sensations that we feel, that increased appetite. Again, there are some studies out there. In cancer patients, the literature is not as robust as, let's say, in pain or in nausea. But what it does say is that if you're using this, it can help to stabilize weight. It won't necessarily increase the weight of patients. It does have some effect on, on appetite. Um, in some other sort of areas, such as Alzheimer's or AIDS patients, we see more of an effect in terms of increase of appetite and, in fact, some weight gain in some of these patients. This is a really interesting trial. This was, again, a Canadian trial. Canadians have a, a big stake in research in terms of cannabinoids. This was a group that was uh, actually out of uh, Montreal and Edmonton, and they looked at um, the use of this, this drug, this dronabinol. This is a pharmaceutical cannabinoid, and they used it in patients with advanced cancers to try to increase their taste sensation. As, as you know, many people have difficulties with taste over time. So they used a small amount of the THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, either twice or three times a day. They compared this to placebo uh, for approximately three weeks. And they were able to see that there was a significant improve, improvement in their did it taste and smell food? There was an increased appetite, and there was an increase in protein intake. There wasn't an increase in weight, but people were eating more and feeling better about it. And interestingly, they also looked at quality of life measures. In other words, they wanted to see, is this impacting the patients in other ways? And the first one that they found, people felt a little more relaxed. So that kind of makes sense, knowing what uh, marijuana can do. And again, people have this better quality of sleep. We see that in many, many studies as a kind of a side benefit that, you know, fix their pain, but they sleep better. An area that is just emerging, just starting to get more clinical um, information coming out, looking at this in the research labs as well, is something that we call neuroprotection. In other words, can the use of a cannabinoid or a marijuana help to prevent damage to the nerves? And this has been seen in um, what I would call benign uh, areas, so such as stroke prophylaxis or in something such as Parkinsonism, where you have degeneration of the nerve. And now that we're, we're starting to see some evidence of it in cancer as well. 
These two studies that you see up there, one of them is a uh, preclinical study. In other words, it was done on a, a rat model, and they were able to show that using a chemotherapy agent and marijuana or cannabinoid extract will prevent the problems from that chemotherapy, the buzziness, the nerve degeneration that we get. And the second is a small trial, but uh, what I think quite important, looking at the use of cannabis in patients, or cannabinoid extract, sorry, in patients who have already had difficulty with chemotherapy-induced nerve pain. And this is a study that comes out of Halifax again. So really important, um, really important studies from us to build on, um, especially when we're talking about cancer patients having that, that ongoing problem with nerve pain. My last bit in terms of the evidence, we talked about insomnia. In other words, can we see how this uh, benefits patients? It really is a secondary finding. There hasn't been any wide or widespread or big studies looking at sleep alone, although there has been a lot of discussion about that. I'm sure that we'll see that fairly soon. And then we have this whole thing around anxiety. We know uh, that there's some preclinical evidence of what's going on, but there hasn't been, again, a large scale study looking at the use uh, in people who have anxiety either associated with cancer or other sorts of conditions. We can, though, and this is where this slide comes in, talk about how the um, cannabis can help reduce some of that that um, anxiety sensation, we've seen that in patients who have nausea, that was well documented. We also know that low doses of the cannabis can produce sedation, in other words, you feel a little more tired and take away that anxiety without getting high. And that's where the medical dosing versus the recreational dosing is very different. The other thing that we're just noticing now, and especially because we can isolate these different cannabinoids from marijuana, the drug, the, the compound cannabidiol, has an anti-anxiety effect. This has been shown in experimental purposes, but it hasn't been used again in a large scale study. What we do see, though, in different types of psychiatric uh, anxiety, including things like PTSD or generalized anxiety disorder, they are starting to use this in a clinical fashion. This is a study that was published back uh, last year. Um, this is a group out of, um, I think this is a group out of Toronto, if I remember correctly. Uh, Dr. Fraser is a psychiatrist working with the Department of National Defense, and he used this drug, Navalone, to help out with patients who are having severe problems from their PTSD, and he was able to show some excellent benefit for those individuals. This next slide, these are uh, actual um, headlines that I pulled off the internet. This now is probably a couple of years old when we look at it, but this is the information that's out there. They, uh, people or the, um, there are websites that say that cannabis can cure cancer. In fact, some of it says how cannabis cures cancer and why no one knows. So there's an accusation that we as physicians are keeping information from patients. Um, that's, that's so wrong when you read it. It's, it just uh, gets me so upset when I see things like this. Yes, people have been looking at cannab cannabinoids and cannabis in cancer. They've been doing research with cells. They've been doing research with animals. There is no evidence in humans that we have any benefit from the use of, of uh, marijuana or cannabinoids yet. Uh, I say yet because there are clinical trials that are in progress. We have, uh, my knowledge, about three or four trials across the world. There's one in Israel. There's one in the States. There's at least one in, in Europe that's looking at adding in some form of um, extract from cannabis to see if we're going to get any benefit for patients, maybe a survival benefit or killing more of the cancer. We're going to have to see how that goes. What I really emphasize to everybody is that cannabis alone is not a cure for cancer. Do not use cannabis instead of chemotherapy. If your physician offers you chemotherapy as a potential cure or even as a, um, a, a way of uh, keeping the cancer under control, you could use the cannabis as well as the chemo, but anyone who has used cannabis instead of chemotherapy in my practice have all died. 
And it's really sad because those have been young patients, people who, despite all of our explanations, chose a different way. So what do we need to know about getting medical cannabis in Canada? Well, certainly, you know, at the street corner, often people will be able to tell you it's easy to get cannabis. I just have to talk to my niece, my nephew, my grandson, those sorts of things. But when we take a look at it, there actually are other ways of, of obtaining it. And this is where we'll, we'll talk about each of those. So prescription cannabinoids, in other words, cannabis extracts that have been made into pills or tablets or something like that are available. The Nabilone is an oral capsule. It's been approved and is out there. It's uh, available in all the provinces across Canada. Dronabinol, the first one that's been crossed out, unfortunately has been taken off the market. It's still available in the States, um, but it too was a THC um, analog. Nabiximols or Sativex is available in Canada. It's not necessarily approved by all the provinces. It has been approved by Health Canada. Um, there are some third-party insurance companies that will actually cover it and it's been indicated for pain associated with MS as well as cancer. In terms of cannabis, the products that are out there are amazingly innumerable. There are all kinds of very innovative people who have put cannabis into things such as edibles, cookies, um, gummy bears, things like that. But the things that are actually approved by the uh, Health Canada are some smoked cannabis or smoked herbal cannabis for smoking, herbal cannabis for vaporization, and the oils that are available through the licensed producers. And those are the only things that Health Canada supports. The vaporizer, not very many people know about what a vaporizer is. It's a, uh, a machine that allows the marijuana to be heated to a certain uh, temperature without burning it. And it's the burning that releases all of those dangerous chemicals. It's the same as burning cigarettes. <clears throat> if we're looking at something like this, this is a volcano, what you would do is you would put a little bit of uh, marijuana into something like this, <coughs> put it up here, turn on the volcano, the heating element will heat it to a point where that all those um, active components kind of uh, vaporize out and will be able to be collected, in this case, in a balloon. There are some others, such as this one, the air riser, where if you put a, um, a straw at the top, you'll be able to use that to vaporize and to, to, to inhale those um, components. This other one, which is kind of uh, brand new to me, I have only st uh, started to see it in the past six months to a year, this is a, a small handheld device that does exactly the same thing. This is the straw, and you can actually pop it into your purse or into your pocket quite easily. Canada now lists 36 licensed producers. A number of those producers are rowing, but they aren't necessarily um, offering it to the public. I think what's happened is that there are some growers that are offering it to the licensed producers that, that offer it to the public. So, there's kind of like support for these others. The licensed producers that do sell to the product, a number of them, almost all of them have um, some form of dried marijuana. A smaller proportion of them have oil. Their oils had to be approved by Health Canada before, before they were able to be approved for sale. But then, you know, you've got this confusion. You've got this long list of producers who are out there, but you don't know what, what makes one LP better than the other or different from the other? Are all the products safe? We'll talk about that in a second. Many of these um, uh, strains still have street names, and I don't, I don't know what Jack the Ripper or Green Kush or AK-47 means. So that's, that's a bit of a confusing thing as well. And then one must always be aware, can this company supply you with your marijuana on a regular basis if you run out of that marijuana, will they be able to get the supply to you in time so that you're not suffering again? So really important question. And if we take a look at it, there are probably greater than 30, 300 strains that are out uh, there looking at, or sorry, available to us. I've got a wrong number here. That should be 36. I apologize. 
Most strains were developed for recreational use. A number of them still have their common names, such as the AK-47 or Green Kush. Um, but if we take a look at it, we can see some trends. We can see that there are those who have higher, moderately to high THC with low CBD. There are those that have a moderate CBD and a low THC. And then you have those that have an equivalent or a balanced THC to CPD ratio. And that's really important because that's where I start most of my patients. I don't know how they're going to respond to this. I want to see how they, they do with this. And the oils that are out there follow the same pattern. They have THC rich, CBD rich, and then a balanced portfolio. A number of the companies are now starting to list these minor cannabinoids, things like the um, CBC, the THC, CV, a number of these sorts of other components that we're not quite sure what's, uh, what's their effect. Terpenoids, flavonoids, these are other important parts of the marijuana plant. In fact, many people feel that the terpenoids are the next big um, area of research as well as clinical use. I hear from some people, is this as good as what's on the street? In fact, it's better than what's on the street. The um, Health Canada set the bar very high for these licensed producers. Their grow ops are incredibly clean. They are uh, very safe. There's a huge amount of security that goes into it. All of their products must be tested, and they're tested for things like uh, bacteria, fungi, metals, pesticides. The, any sort of the, the level of pesticide has to be incredibly low or else it's going to be taken off the market. The marijuana, the product, is delivered to you in your home as long as you have a mailbox. If you have only a post office box, there, you know, there are ways of getting it. Um, the concentration of the individual components must be labeled, uh, it must be um, uh, stated. And those are usually just the THC CBD, but it gives me as a practitioner an idea of what I can prescribe for patients. And because this is all monitored, if there's a bad batch out there, they can recall it. And in fact, in the very early stages of this, uh, this program, they were able to pull back a few lots that were out there that were found to have high levels of, I think it was microbial, if I remember correctly. Some of the things to think about when you're talking to your physician about uh, medical marijuana, both physicians and nurse practitioners are, uh, have been approved to um, um, assess and authorize the use of medical marijuana. This is not like a prescription. You can't pick it up at a pharmacy. You have to go directly to these licensed producers and they all run their own websites. I call them virtual marijuana stores. When we're talking about who should receive and who shouldn't receive marijuana, I personally have some contraindications. In other words, the people that I will not prescribe to because of the risks may be quite high. Those who have active psychosis or schizophrenia, and that comes from some of the research that we've seen in people who are using it for recreational purposes. This can uh, cause a worsening of that situation, may even cause people to, to um, go into uncontrolled psychosis. Unstable heart disease, we know that marijuana can drop the blood pressure and people who already have angina or um, unstable angina can have uh, quite significant troubles with that. Anyone who's pregnant makes sense. If you're going to be taking in a drug that has so, uh, so many different effects upon the body, it's definitely going to have some effects upon the baby. And I think that, that, I think that we don't know enough upon, uh, about the transmission of these things to babies that we should be doing anything. And then there's this whole thing about how old should you be to receive medical marijuana. There's uh, a lot of evidence that marijuana, when abused, can cause problems with cognitive development. These are usually patients or, or kids that are under the age of 21, some people say 25. A young brain takes time to reach its full development. And for that reason, many people say, do not prescribe to anyone under these ages. It's also important to think about, for, for me as a physician, whether there were some legal issues, are the people uh, looking to use this marijuana for illegal purposes, or are they going to divert it, sell it on the street? Um, I want to find out if there's other drug use, um, because that can make some complications in terms of what are they using it for. 
And of course, you know, what was their use of uh, cannabis previously? Interestingly, there's a minority of patients who used it pre previously for recreational purposes that are coming to me to use it for medical purposes. I think that those people <coughs> that could get it for recreational purposes just continue to use it and don't think they need to see a doctor. Many of the things listed on this slide, the adverse effects or the um, side effects, are seen in um, patients who have who have been using it for recreational purposes. They often are using a much higher dose than we would use for medical purposes. However, many patients still tell me they have that drowsiness, and that's good. If you dose the drug at night and you're having trouble with sleepiness or, or insomnia, that's perfect. You can use a little bit of it, and it'll help you to sleep. The dry mouth we hear about, um, and especially uh, with those who are using high doses, if you're using a smaller dose, not usually the problem. The delirium, psychosis, cognition, that feeling of high um, is very much minimized in patients who are using it for medical purposes because they just don't use as much. And then there's all these other things that we'll need to start looking at in terms of a research um, especially patients who are being treated for cancer and are going on to live healthy lives. So how can we get marijuana from our doctors? How can we actually ask the physicians to, what sort of work do we have to do to get this? And the process is fairly straightforward. You as the patient would go and find a, um, a licensed producer from one of their online sites. I have made up a list of all of the producers and I do give it to my patients with some directions and with some uh, ideas of who I've used in the past without necessarily telling patients you must, you, you must use this one or that one. I really like patients to, to do a little bit of comparison shopping before we decide which is going to be best for them. When they've decided, then I get to um, fill in a, a document. So some information about the patient, information about myself, they get sent off to that licensed producer. This also includes the dosing for patients. And I usually, if it's a new patient who's never used before, I usually have a short period of time, a small dose, maybe anywhere from two to three grams per day um, and over a three to six month period, just to see how patients do with it. And if everything goes well, then I can increase that to as long as a year um, that needs to be renewed every year. You as the patient would go off and get an application form to the licensed producer. Again, it's all found on the website. Many of them have um, forms that can be filled in on the computer, printed out and sent in to the, um, to the, uh, to the producer. Uh, they often, not all, but many of them maintain fax numbers, so we're able to do it that way. Um, we have yet to be able to just send it in as uh, PDFs over the internet. I think that there's uh, still some worry about uh, security and people who are trying to game the system. Once the producer receives all the information, then it will be able to put everything together, my document with the document from the patient, match them up, say, ah, this patient is to receive this many grams per month and we'll send off a product to them. Um, there may be some discussion. Certainly all of the licensed producers have customer service pay people who are there to help with, uh, patients, help to guide them and such. Many of the licensed producers also have a selection of what they would call accessories, things like those vaporizers, things like, <coughs> excuse me, um, things like other sort of products that can help patients uh, administer these drugs in a, in a better fashion. This is an example of the uh, medical document that I would be producing for a, uh, a company. Um, this is you know, pretty generic, but you can see looking at it all that it is not very uh, onerous. In fact, I can finish one of these in a patient that I know well within five to seven minutes and this can be sent off the same day, either by fax or, you know, in the mail. So in summary, I think it's really important for us to remember that, that cannabis and cannabinoids do have a role. It certainly is not as a first-line agent, but maybe as a second or third-line agent for patients, especially if things have been tried and we aren't getting any benefit. 
So if the pain is there and we've tried to use um, some painkillers, maybe something like a, like a, tr a tricyclic antidepressant or other drugs that might help with nerve pain, and we're not getting the benefit, <coughs> then I think that we need to uh, consider using this in addition to those drugs. The strongest evidence comes from pain, nausea, and appetite in our patients who have cancer. There are some other areas that might be uh, applicable, but we just don't have enough research to tell us that uh, absolutely this is where we should put it. Some of that research will start coming. Um, the federal government has, um, has uh, said that it will support the use of research, especially in medical patients, once this whole legalization thing is uh, up and running. Um, now, that's not a public statement. We've heard it from uh, other private sources. We in the, um, in the community, the scientific community, are hopeful that they'll actually follow through on that one. And certainly, more research is needed. We need to know what are the doses that, we, that patients should use. What is the con uh, constituents? Is it more THC? Is it more CBD? Is it an equal amount of each? Is it different? Other parts of the marijuana plant, those cannabinoids that are important for patients. How, how much of those are, um, I, how, how much do they use per day? Is it just a gram? Is it more than that? Are there other sorts of ways that we can get it into patients? There are um, a number of different projects underway looking at things such as um, marijuana patches or cannabinoid patches. There's single dose inhalers that are being um, uh, trialed in different countries. All these things will be uh, important in order to make it easier for patients to take their marijuana and in, in order to know how much the dose is. So I think that things will really, um, I, I think things are going to really pick up in the next five years. It's, it's rather exciting for those of us who have been dealing with marijuana for some time. And I think that we're going to see that patients are going to be the uh, recipients of a lot of good, uh, good and innovative products in the next little while. So what I'd like to do now is open up the uh, open it up to questions. I know that Matt will help me with this, um, and I'm uh, hopeful that we'll, we have lots of questions to um, to answer today. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Dadek. Um, now, so we're waiting for questions to come in now. It didn't, didn't look like we had anybody uh, ask anything during the presentation. So, um, what I'll do is maybe just get us. Uh, started off here and kind of go back to um, when you were talking about uh, when um, when or if uh, recreational use of, of uh, cannabis is legalized. Um, at that point, if, if or when it does happen, what do you think that means for uh, LPs and, and patients? It, I think it's going to be very interesting. I, um, I, I do know at least one person who's on the task force that's been uh, assigned to look at this whole project. Um, there, the Health Canada and the government is, is very adamant that they're not going to lose the whole medical portion of the project. They want very much to make sure that pa medical patients have access. There is some hints that maybe it's going to be supported uh, financially, so instead of patients having to pay for it themselves, that there might be a program that allows patients to access some funds to have this uh, done. Um, Certainly, there will be uh, a what, it, what we're hoping is there's going to be a research uh, um, area to to uh, or some research funds that we can use. the The matter of having um, recreational product available, there's still probably going to be um, some. Um, how would I say it? There's going to be regulations. I mean, the government can't uh, approve the use of something like this without knowing that the product is going to be safe that the quality is going to be high, that the um, toxicity is going to be low, you know, all those sorts of things where um, health and safety is going to be important. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. I think that many of the LPs are, are ideally positioned to uh, help out with that, and I think that the medical portion will, it will continue to be um, as, held as important as it is. Okay, thanks. Um, still waiting on uh, questions to come in. Now, just a reminder to everyone, um, you can uh, type your questions in 
there's a, a questions box on the right hand side of your screen. If you don't see uh, that, there should be a, a, an orange uh, button with an arrow on it um, that'll make your uh, control panel open up and then you should see the questions box um, in, that, uh, in that control panel. So just a reminder to everybody who hasn't got any questions in yet um, to do that. Uh, Judy uh, is asking, do you know if there are any contraindications for people on chemo? Not really. Um, in fact, many of the chemotherapies, the standard chemotherapies that we use, have been tested with marijuana or cannabinoid extracts, and there has yet to be any evidence that chemotherapy is affected by marijuana. So in other words, the efficacy, the potency of the chemotherapy is still present there. It's just that some of the quality of the benefit for patients seems to be better. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've had a number of patients who are using either nabalone or smoked marijuana when they get their chemotherapy. They, their nausea has not been controlled with sort of standard medications, and they've ha had no difference in terms of benefit from the chemo, but they certainly feel better coming into the uh, center and getting, those chemo uh, getting that chemotherapy. Okay, we got some questions rolling in now. So uh, Tracy's asking, uh, what is the best diet for cancer patients for recovery that works well with uh, medical cannabis? That's a really good question. I, we haven't had a whole lot of research that helps us with that. I know that there are a number of different um, proponents of diet out there. Um, you know, certainly a healthy diet, uh, minimizing the amount of processed foods, minimizing the amount of sugar is fine. Um, those diets that do away with certain portions altogether, like the non-dairy diet or the non-meat diet, um, have their problems because those patients actually, um, the physiology of the body changes and there could actually be damage coming out of that. You could be asking your body to do things that it doesn't have the abilities to do. It just doesn't have the proper protein or the proper amount of sugar. You can go into um, into different sort of modes, starvation mode, and that's not good either. You know, cancers don't necessarily uh, get um, affected by that because they they um, work on different processes. So, I don't think that we have enough information to recommend one particular diet, but certainly there are some excellent dietitians out there who can help design something for you as an individual. Okay, now we have uh, David asking, uh, what do you think about vaping cannabis oil for a lung cancer patient? Is there a potential risk or is there a potential for helping or aggravating the tumor? Your thoughts would be appreciated. And, you know, that's a really good question. I've had that same sort of argument with other people. Um, certainly, if you're vaping, you're not burning the marijuana. Therefore, you're not exposing the lung to any of the dangerous sort of chemicals that come out of a burning process. So if, uh, if the vaping is done properly, I don't see any problems with it. Bringing it into the lung, bringing that vaporized um, product into the lung actually is, it works quicker than if you're using it orally. And it should not aggravate the cancer itself. Again, I can only go back to those mouse and rat models that say that when we've used it, when we've applied the drug directly to the cancer, it seems to shrink. I think that in this case, using it to help us things such as cough or um, other side effects of the chemotherapy, it's, it's useful and I think that it would be helpful, especially if it's going to mean that you're going to be able to tolerate your chemotherapy longer. Okay, and now we have uh, Jennifer who asks, approximately how much does this cost patients say per month? Are there any extended benefit insurance companies that cover this treatment? As of now, no companies um, cover it on a blanket basis. I know that there are some companies who have looked at individual situations and have approved it for those patients, but there's no one company that says we'll cover marijuana uh, outright. Um, and that gets to be a problem financially. Many of the companies have a basic price for their marijuana. It usually sits around anywhere from about four and a half to five and a half dollars per gram. This is around the same as street prices, so it's not like going to the street, you're going to get something cheaper. 
And if you're using, uh, let's say, two grams per day, and you, you do a little bit of the math, you're looking at somewhere around $300 a month. Unfortunately, that is not, as I said, covered by the pharmacy, Pharmacare or by the health programs, but it is a medical expense so that on your end-of-year income tax, the federal government will cover it. And it's really important to save all your receipts when you're um, accessing medical products. Okay. Um, Gemma says, I had a COPD patient who was a big fan of oil to treat his SOB, which I assume is shortness of breath, and related symptoms. Uh, could you comment on that? Can we recommend this since there's no research associated with it? Yeah, that's, that's, a more, uh, that's a tougher one to recommend. I know that some patients have used it, and I think it's more related to their anxiety. When you get short of breath, you feel really anxious. And as you get more anxious, you get more short of breath. So it's a bit of a vicious circle. So by using a little bit of, uh, of marijuana, whether they're vaping or otherwise, they, people kind of relax and they don't breathe quite as hard. There's a little bit of evidence, and this again comes from animal studies, that maybe it's helping to open up those uh, air passages. People were using a tincture of marijuana or a tincture of cannabis in the 1910s and 1920s for people with asthma well before we had a, all of the more effective drugs that we have now. So, you know, I, 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 can, I, I can argue against it because I think that there are better drugs out there, but I also understand how it might help him if he's got that terrible anxiety related to that shortness of breath. Okay, and we have Joanne who asks, will we still need a doctor prescription when it's legalized for recreational use? Um, that I, I can't say for sure, but I would recommend a physician be involved. Um, you know, those of us who have experience with marijuana, you can certainly pick the wrong stuff very quickly and you can get yourself into terrible troubles. I've had patients who uh, come to me after they've tried street stuff or they've tried someone else's very high THC and they might have, um, you know, bad reactions, they might have uh, hallucinations, psychosis, etc. Um, I'm not sure that the uh, recreational product will be just as good as the marijuana that we're getting from our licensed producers. Um, it, th those are just questions that I can't answer at this time. Okay, and now we have one that asks, um, could you talk about the safety of using cannabis uh, at the same time as conventional pain drugs slash opioids? That's an interesting question. Many of the trials have used the two together, so the safety is there. It's been established. There is very little, um, uh, there's, there's little in the way of worsening adverse effects. The same problems that you get with uh, opioids um, it will still exist, your constipation, something, uh, and, and uh, sedation. The interesting thing, though, is that on all the trials that have been done, all the longer-term trials, the amount of pain medication, that opioid that people use, drops. So, in other words, it's, it's helping, it's making benefit for the patient, and it may actually mean that you're having to use less of those other drugs. In, um, in some of the labs, they've been finding what we call a synergy. So the body uses both of those medications beneficially, and the two of them are better together than they are separately. Okay, so just have a couple more. Um, Debbie is asking, what is the preferred delivery method if the patient has lung cancer? Uh, please discuss the use of oil. Yeah. So. My feeling is if we want to get good benefit and get it over a long period of time, taking the oral, oil in an oral route is probably best. We, we do have to find what dose that is, and it does take a little bit of, of um, experimentation with the physician, but I don't see any problem with that. Many of the oils, oh, sorry, each of the light producers make an oil and they have a certain concentration so much uh, so many milliliters of oil is equivalent to this many grams of, of dried marijuana and each company has their own um, ratio there so it's hard to say for any individual patient how much to use 
but it would be, I, I think, starting with a small dose and working their way up to finding the, the benefit is, is easy to do. It wouldn't take very long. Within a couple of weeks, I think we should be able to find the benefit, or sorry, the beneficial dose for those patients. Um, oil is, you know, all oil is, it's, at least in Canada, is they've extracted using a, a different process all of those organic parts, all of the chemicals um, or compounds, and they put it into an edible oil, things like coconut oil or olive oil. Um, and then people are able to take that through the mouth as opposed to having to smoke it or vaporize it. Um, some people have vaporized the oil. I'm not convinced that that's going to be any better than taking it orally. In fact, the oral oil we know lasts a long time. You get that benefit for 8 to 12 hours. Now, if you're talking about pain, if we can actually minimize the pain for 8 to 12 hours, that's a whole lot better than four or less. Okay, a couple more questions and just a couple more minutes to go here, so uh, we'll try and fit these both in. Um, Judy asks, is there anything in marijuana that can help for fatigue and lack of energy uh, from chemotherapy? Not that we know at this time. That, that is a really good question. We know that um, the fatigue goes with chemotherapy. It's part of the... Um, it's part of the, the side effects of the turning on the immune system, that overwhelming fatigue. And we don't know yet what sort of components of marijuana may have an effect upon that. Um, it'll be interesting to see, especially as they kind of tease out what are the, the other components of marijuana that could have activity on our, our bodies. Um, again, I'm going to have to say stay tuned. In the next three to five years, we may have more information. Okay, and then last one from Joanne. She says, uh, very difficult to find a doctor to prescribe an Ottawa. My aunt refuses, as well as my family doc. Is there a list? Um, unfortunately, we don't have a list. I'd love one. I'd be able to, to talk to patients all over the place. There are, though, some companies. Um, th these are companies that are, they call themselves uh, cannabinoid education companies. They have set up clinics in various places. I know there's at least one in the Ottawa area. Um, things like Canna Connect or uh, cannabinoid clinics, the cannabinoid medical clinics. Um, I know in Montreal there is something called Sante Cannabis. I've actually toured that. I was very impressed with the high level of safety and um, really, you know, important education that they give patients in order to further understand the use of medical cannabis. These companies, um, their, their main purpose is to educate people and then they can connect people with the various licensed producers. Physicians are involved in this process so that the approval process can, can take place. Okay, so that, uh, that concludes our Q&A session. Uh, thanks everybody who, uh, who sent in all the questions. I think that was, uh, that was really great. Um, so now I'd just like to th uh, take this opportunity to, uh, to thank Dr. Danning for joining us today. Um, I think uh, we, all, we all learned lots, so that's, uh, that's really, really great. Um, so I just want to remind everybody to uh, stay tuned to the CCSM website and uh, sign up for our e-letter if you haven't um, for other opportunities to join our webinars. Um, this is actually our final webinar of 2016, um, so we'd like to wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season, um, and we look forward to seeing all of you at future webinars in the new year. And now just a reminder for anybody who didn't hear earlier, um, the webinar is going to be available online tomorrow, uh, full video on YouTube, as well as uh, slides on our SlideShare account. And links to both of those will be sent out tomorrow afternoon, and you can also find them on the front page of the website. Um, so that's it for us today. Uh, we hope you all have a wonderful afternoon, and we will see you next time.